India, Iran, Romania, among several other countries. Mark has also defended, successfully defended many human rights activists, including Julian Assange. And Mark has authored five books on the importance of free speech during the uh, free speech and human right aspects. So now, also, if, if anybody wants to know more about Mark, one should visit Mark's uh, 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 Wikipedia page, which speaks volumes of his achievements all throughout his career as a lawyer. And these are the few things that I could gather. And if Mark permits, Mark, today we are going to focus on a very important issue. And this issue concerns the importance of free speech in a pandemic time, because we have been seeing that some people criticize the responses of the government towards how they are handling the COVID-19 situation. And that has led people to come out against the government and speak. And then we have seen that government in response have actually punished those people for speaking out against the government. And they say that this is something which is violative of the nation interest and citizens should cope up with the government then criticize it openly because it defeats the purpose of a nation in such a time. So Mark, if you permit, I would like, I have a few questions to ask you and then we will open Right, that'd be fun, fabulous, Sid. Yeah. So with your permission, should I start asking you with the first question? So my first question to you is that, do you think that the status of fundamental right, particularly the freedom of speech, reduces during a pandemic or it continues to enjoy the same status that it enjoys during a normal time? Well, I think it enjoys the same status. So it is one of those fundamental rights, a root right, if you will, uh, a, wrote, uh, a right which is fundamentally important amongst human rights. But of course, there may be a pressing need um, during a pandemic to truncate those uh, rights to freedom of expression for a limited period of time. So if we look around the world at uh, the way in which uh, COVID emergency legislation has been brought in to curtail um, both reporting and uh, speaking about uh, the COVID situation, it's very interesting in how that's been addressed. So what you're doing is and what a government needs to understand is that they're taking away from someone's human rights. So they must demonstrate that there is what we call a pressing social need, that society requires that there should be some small limitation on human rights only for the duration of the pandemic. Now let's take President Duterte in the Philippines, for example. He is one of the trendsetters on the abuse of COVID emergency powers. Um, and these are laws of general application. So they're not media laws, they're not traditional censorship laws, but they're being used to go after journalists who are critical of his government's response to COVID. And so since April, he's prosecuted two mainstream journalists and 17 blogger cricket critics who now stand in jeopardy of up to two months in jail plus a 20,000 US dollar fine. Now, that's quite a chilling uh, effect to have on someone's free speech. And it's not suggested that these people are saying something inappropriate, like the vaccine doesn't work. What these people are doing is saying, actually our government's not dealing with COVID very effectively. So I can say that perfectly happily about Boris Johnson and his government, and it's obviously true. He's making a complete hash of it. We are, you know, international embarrassment in the way in which our COVID uh, response has taken place. Thankfully, our scientists have come through with the very first vaccine, closely followed by others, of course. But we haven't had those COVID emergency powers. I'm allowed, by reference to the free speech guaranteed under the unwritten constitution of the United Kingdom, but also under the rights of the UN that are guaranteed by the UN Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, Article 19, and Article 10 of the European Convention on Human Rights, the right to free, speak freely and hold opinions. 
And so I think there's a big difference. And I think there's some discussion. I hope that the audience will contribute to and let us know how things are in their particular com countries on how well uh, or how badly their countries are dealing with um, the laws on this. So there's an attempt, if you like, to silence uh, people who are critics of the government rather than those that spread false news. There are allegations where um, fake news laws have been championed by the media as a way to uh, protect journalists. But of course, what's happening is that that attempt at uh, protecting against fake news is being used against legitimate journalists, journalists who are critics of the government, critics of the way in which COVID is being used. And so those laws are being uh, laws of general applicability are now being weaponized against journalists. And of course, in a pandemic, it's absolutely critical that we as the general public receive all shades and colors of opinion so that we can make up our minds on what's ba the basis of the information given to us, what is the right thing to do? And it's, it's critical that we have that free flow of information. And so the question I think that we need to recognize is that if there is a need to perhaps uh, guard against fake information, false news, so for example, that the um, injections uh, are a way of taking over your mind, which some lunatics think, then in those circumstances, you may want to ban that kind of bad information. But you can't stop somebody, I think, criticizing. So even in a pandemic, freedom of speech has a really important role in holding governments to account enabling the public to make wise and good choices by receiving information and differences of opinion. Yes. So Mark, right, like rightly mentioned that citizens have a right to receive information and they have to compare and then decide for themselves which information they rather believe to be more authentic than something that is being fed to them by the government. Now, my next question to you is only on this issue because we have seen during the pandemic there are two people, there are two class of people who are at the receiving end of the state. Firstly, it was it is the medical professionals, and secondly, the journalists. Now, why I say these two bodies? Because firstly, the medical professionals, it, it has been seen like in, in India, in UK, in US, that medical professionals were proscribed from speaking to the journalists and they were restricted from speaking against the government. For example, in India, there was a doctor who wrote a piece on the internet where he criticized the government and he complained about the lack of facilities in the COVID center. The, the yes, next... he, he was complaining about a lack of protective gear, wasn't he? And then what happened? The state issued a criminal sanction against him. He moved to the court. The court said that the doctor should not be arrested, but the court itself imposed the condition that he should not write anything on the Facebook. And also, the state, do you think firstly, like in relation to the medical professional, my question is, do you think that it is a legitimate proportionate restriction on free speech? And now coming to the second element of the question regarding journalists, the so government- should we, do, should we deal with the medical bit first? Because yes. yes. I think that's an interesting element. And it seems to me that, you know, we have good and bad in all professions. We have competent and incompetent. But the reality is that I think we have to trust our medical professionals to comply with their Hippocratic oath, their oath to do no harm. And in those circumstances, I think, you know, we draw attention. So if they're giving false information about the disease, about its transmission, then that's potentially harmful. So if you have a medical man saying, don't wear a mask because they don't do any good, that's probably not very helpful. But if you have people who say, as this doctor did, because uh, he was complaining about the lack of protective gear, that seems to me to be a perfectly legitimate thing to say. I mean, these people are frontline professionals, the doctors, the nurses, the medical people are putting their lives on their line. The people who work in hospitals, even as cleaners are there, they're putting their lives on the line every day. They are entitled to protective gear to be of the best quality. And I think most countries have had this challenge. 
our own country was very poor. So the, the United Kingdom was very poor at the beginning, but now doctors have very good uh, protective equipment. It's quite clear that they won't pass disease uh, even in the situation where there's, uh, they're on operations or in very close proximity with people. And in those circumstances, I think we're, uh, we should be fighting very hard to hear from the, from the medical professionals about what's going wrong. What are our governments not doing? What, are, what failings have the governments made in not providing protective gear that could put patients at jeopardy? That's a perfectly legitimate thing. And I would say there was a pressing need to know that information if it's true. So I think that legitimate criticism in that area is OK. The only area where I think you can get to a justification of restricting this right to free speech, I think, is around the area where somebody says something isn't true. So you say that you can't pass it on by exchange of saliva and they're encouraging kissing or something. Then in those circumstances, that would be a very dangerous thing. And I think that that doctor should be disciplined by the medical profession for doing harm as opposed to doing no harm. But I'm not sure that actually preventing someone from writing the truth on Facebook is a bad is a good idea. And I think that's the sort of thing where we find that governments are making laws which infringe the guaranteed minimum rights to free speech that are enshrined in Article 19, which is, applies to every Commonwealth nation around the world. And in those circumstances, they should be promoting the right to criticize because nobody has a monopoly on knowledge and wisdom in a pandemic. We're all learning and we should be able to learn freely without let or hindrance from one another. Right, Mark. Like you rightly said that one thing that should be focused upon is that nobody's trying to harm somebody by spreading false news. Like we had just Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes once said that persons who shout falsely in a, in a theater that there is a fire should be punished because he is doing harm. Now, yes. Mark, this also brings me to another question, which is relevant for furthering this discussion on this issue, is that you look at, like, you, you see that there are media persons who are, who are siding with the government and there are media persons who are actually going out and taking a risk to bring out the right information out to the public. Now, what the state in some jurisdictions did, they introduced some guidelines that the media and public should not publish anything which is based on their independent sources, but they should only release information that is provided by the state agencies. Now we know that during the pandemic, a lot of information which was spread by the government was not true. Like you are rightly mentioned yourself, that there was a discrepancy between the actual reality on the ground as medical professionals stated in their statements and what was actually happening or what, what government said out to the public. So there are discrepancies in the information that is being released by the state and some journalists digging deep to understand the reality on the actual ground. Now, do you think that state's imposition of such a rule that you should only publish information which is released by the state agencies and if you don't do that, we would punish you because then you would be booked under the fake news laws. Then do you yeah. think such a restriction is reasonable, proportionate, and necessary in a democracy? No, it's clearly not reasonable or proportionate. It goes back to this point about who has the monopoly on wisdom. And I think it's only in totalitarian states do uh, the governments think that they know everything uh, or pretend they know everything. What we uh, must do is learn not only from our fellow citizens, no one person, it's quite clear, has uh, all of the answers. And it may be that you need a data scientist as well as a social scientist to talk about the age demographics and the greater risks depending on the age brackets and uh, things that make people particularly vulnerable, like underlying uh, health conditions. And all of those things were not well understood by anyone at the beginning of the pandemic. 
and uh, governments certainly didn't have a monopoly on that wisdom. So it's absolutely critical that that information and that serious scientific debate is in an area of protected speech so that we can have those discussions about what is it and we need to start a debate an academic debate so effectively uh the online environment the news organizations and including the government and the state and their scientists have the benefit of a like virtual academic uh common room where you can have a space to discuss ideas, to put thoughts and processes in and come up with solutions and developments to be able to work better to combat the crisis. And if you rely on one group of government appointed flunkies who may not be the experts in the field, I mean, in one country, the supposed expert on COVID is in fact a maternity doctor. Now, I mean, what does a maternity doctor know beyond a general doctor? What's going on? You want someone who is, you know, specialist in the kind of coronavirus type diseases, you know, the SARS type diseases that we've seen. We want to understand it working on a, a cellular and, and molecular level. And the more information that we can get, not only from our own state, but other countries. So it may be that you have great uh, research in several different universities, but not in the government in India. But you may also find that universities and corporations in other countries of the world, whether that's in Europe or North America or wherever it is, are going to come up with information and ideas which are unknown to a government or a politician, but their, their ideas are much more likely to be valid, much more likely to be something that we should all pay attention and learn from than our governments. And what we don't want to do is to create a, an artificial bubble where all we hear is state approved news. That way lies totalitarianism, that way lays disaster, and that way lays infection. Yeah, to be, to be very true to the times that we are living in. Now, Mark, you talk about the, 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 the situation turning to be more authoritarian. And this is what I want to ask you next question. My next question pertains to the chilling effect of laws which are being made during the pandemic time. And those laws which do not define an offense, but only prescribes punishment. What I mean to say is that if you look the state, for example, in Singapore, fake news law, it says that if you spread fake news, you would be facing criminal charges. Now, what is fake news is still to be determined by the state itself. Now, such a open definition of fake news is very problematic because it causes chilling effect on the right of the citizens. Because if I have some information that I want to share with somebody, but I can't do it because I, I may be under the impression or fear that if I send it to somebody, then I might be prosecuted by the state because what if it's not true? So my right as a citizen to share information that I believe in has been restricted. It has been the duty of my that I have to make sure whatever information that I receive is 100% true, which cannot be expected. I think your free speech right does not mean that you have to be 100% accurate with whatever you are saying. That's right, yeah. And another aspect of this question is that the government says this is only to prevent fake news, but also some states have taken actions. For example, in Bangladesh, Myanmar, there was a complete suspension of internet in order to protect the fake news from being spread to the public. And also, if you look at the way the state turned out, they are in India and in many other countries, they are out and arresting descendants. They are using the fake news laws in order to arrest people who are going against the government during the pandemic time. Because look in Turkey, in many other countries, they are incarcerating people who are dissenters and they are using such laws to fight against fake news. But if you look at some experts from UN, they are encouraging usage of more public information. They are focusing, they're saying that rather than accepting such stringent measures, the government should communicate more with the citizen. They should encourage public messaging. They should go out 
on public education on covid so do you think that these measures which are suggested by the expert are 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 least restrictive or these can be adopted in order to defeat the regimes using stringent measures in order to turn authoritarian because i think one thing that has to be seen during this pandemic is that most states have become more towards the authoritarian so i yeah, want to i i think that's right said and i think one of the challenges is that people countries are using covid as a cover to be able to introduce laws about fake news and at the moment they're saying well they're fake news about covid but that's a very short step to fake news about uh, other things or indeed just straightforward dissent so you see in egypt in turkey and some of the gulf countries we're seeing really stringent laws being brought in as well as well as in the asia uh, pacific region but i think you know let's take an example which sets outside covid for a moment just a way of example and i would say to people when you're measuring these laws as to whether they're a good law or a bad law think about whether you would trust your life to the government to the person in the government do they know everything and if the answer to that is no then the restriction that prevents you knowing more isn't a lawful restriction because that i think is the undermining of it but what we are seeing you're right and it's this i i mentioned this use of laws of general application so normally if you're a journalist or a media outlet a newspaper television station you have to deal with libel laws maybe privacy laws but in those cases truth is always a defense however what we're seeing is fake news laws covid emergency laws and those kinds of things and also criminalization of speech so one of the other basic tenets that we see in human rights law in international law which applies to every single one of us in whichever country it is it's a basic minimum standard guaranteed by international covenant and standards so take the international covenant on civil and political rights of the un article 19 it guarantees us the right to know information and to be able to impart information but what they're doing is trying to restrict it so if you say i'm having a law for a pandemic then there should be a sunset clause on that that law should cease to apply when the vaccine is effective and we effect have effective your herd immunity but how many of these laws have a sunset clause how many of these laws that are supposedly emergency laws which take away from our right to free speech how many of them have an end date very few if any i'm not aware of any that have an end date they've all been brought in and these laws are going to be abused for the pandemic and they will be abused again after the pandemic as effectively fake news laws and fake news will be defined anything that's critical of the regime in power the political people in power so let's look at a slightly different environment but take the hong kong security laws um they are important because people are unlikely to be familiar with them but they may well have a fairly major impact if you're going there and the major thing to remember when you sort of think about the hong kong security laws is that they were drafted with a kind of mainland china mindset so when you're interpreting the laws don't think how a reasonable person would do it think about how the chinese political classes would have thought the laws should apply and that's how it is so they are broadly framed ridiculously broadly framed i would say they were passed in secret so they didn't have public scrutinize scrutinization they criminalize uh what is described as collusion with foreign or external forces so that includes talking to a media organization like the new york times or the guardian or you know the daily telegraph or any any newspaper anywhere in the world or the bbc and intimidation and intimidation is also criminalized but what does intimidation means well that's peaceful protest to you and me 
That's the right to take to the streets and say, I disagree with what the government is doing. So this gives Beijing particularly new powers to control life in Hong Kong that they never had before. And there's two points about it. So we're really talking about speech in, in main terms here, but obviously it can go further than that. So the crimes are punishable by life imprisonment and an unlimited fine. And the scope of the legislation is so very broad that if you commit criminal damage to public transport, that can be charged as terrorism. Now, most reasonable people wouldn't think if you, you know, cut the seat on a, uh, on a bus, that that would be terrorism. It may be an act of vandalism, but there's a quantum difference between vandalism and terrorism. And everybody understands that. Companies can be fined. And the judges who are appointed, especially appointed by the Beijing appointed chief executive of Hong Kong. So only approved judges get to hear these sensitive cases. And the more serious cases are sent to the mainland China. And of course, if you're having a law like this, which is repressive, you'd have to have the trials in secret because otherwise you might have protesters on the streets complaining about it. So you get into a really, really problematic area. And I'm using this as an example, not because I want to single out Hong Kong or be critical of the legislation there and in China, although I think it is uh, right to criticize it, but I do think it has much wider implications. And what China is doing is it's setting the new gold standard for repression amongst totalitarian regimes. And we know that other regimes whose uh, politicians are under criticism and attack, uh, and by, I mean sort of verbal attack, um, are going to try and adopt these laws for themselves and use it to push back and to shore themselves up in, 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 in society. So now we're in a, a really weird place in Hong Kong. So journalists and lawyers who are sus just suspected of breaching this security law can be wiretapped and put under surveillance. So we protect journalists and journalist sources. We think that a lawyer's office is sacrosanct and it's confidential and that you can impart uh, information in absolute secrecy to your lawyer. That's the one place where you need. Not anymore. Many of us who now ring lawyers in Hong Kong are told at the beginning of the call, um, this call is legally privileged as far as I'm concerned, but you should be aware that there's a possibility that we're being tapped by local law enforcement. And so the same is true if you're speaking to journalists in Hong Kong. And of course, it's a way of deterring people talking to journalists in Hong Kong. And of course, if you say something to a journalist in Hong Kong, you may well implicate them and make it difficult for the journalist in the eyes of Beijing. So I think there are real, real problems here. Now, I can see President Duterte, for example, adopting these kinds of laws with some anacrity. And so what you're doing is you're putting people in jeopardy. Now, if we have a libel law, we say we have uh, freedom of speech and freedom before speech, but free speech may be quite expensive speech if you libel somebody because you're going to pay damages and you're going to pay legal costs. But you don't go to jail. And the problem with these laws, both the ones that President Duterte has in the COVID emergency laws and the new Hong Kong security laws and the fake news laws, is that they criminalize free speech. So you send somebody to jail for just what they say? That cannot be right. That isn't right in the Inter-American Court of Human Rights, in the African Court of Human Rights, in the UN Committee on Human Rights and the European Court. This isn't some Western notion which is being imposed. This is a global notion that everybody on planet Earth, by reference to being a human being, is entitled to those protections and they're being eroded and taken away. Very well said, Mark. And also, uh, like you rightly pointed out, that if you are in China, and you know the conviction rate in China is more than 99%. So you know that once the law is imposed, then you are not going to get out from the jail forever. And 
and i think when i when i ask you this question that laws are being broadly worded i think we and this is becoming a new normal in many countries adopting such laws and i think the inception of such laws started from china and if we look at it now what the countries are also adopting is a technique of mass surveillance now you for in the name of contact tracing in the name of uh, discovering who is meeting whom and especially a covid patient the state is putting a check upon your movements it monitors your calls it monitors everything like you rightly pointed out that it puts people on risk who are actually working on the ground to discover the truth for example well, i think you're making an incredibly important point and let's just pause there a moment because i don't want to lose that point so certainly in my country in london we have had uh covid tracing apps put on our phone now we're told that we have to activate them believe that if you will but they're put on we didn't ask to put them on you can download special stuff but essentially what's happened is that the government has made a decision to require the telephony companies to download something onto my phone which tracks not only where i go geographically but also who has a phone which is close to me so it shows where i've had contacts now ostensibly this is a very sensible thing for determining whether i have unknowingly been in the presence of someone with covid but the information isn't ring fenced for the purposes of covid the information is shared with law enforcement the information is shared with the security services and so in those circumstances actually what you've got is the state being able to work out who i'm in contact with who you are in contact with and when and how often we meet and that is an infringement of our personal liberty of our personal privacy and it's not warranted as an infringement by reference to the pandemic because if you were dealing with just the pandemic you would have information you wouldn't need to de-anonymize it you would be able to deal with it and as soon as the information was no longer relevant after 14 days you would dispose of the information but that isn't what's happening what is happening is that that information is going into a supercomputer at gchq and it is being used to plot people so then you say okay well we the state would quite like to know uh who mr x has been in touch with over the last few days and as a consequence they can ascertain whether you've spoken to a journalist whether you've had a, a met with a journalist in a starbucks for coffee and that starts to give them a profile of you and i think that is a real problem area and i think you know so we're seeing real problems with the sort of gathering of data there are no checks and balances on the gathering of this data there's been much discussion about it but the voices who say you've got to be careful and you've got to agree to remove the data are being drowned out by government voices saying we're going to take this it's a responsible thing to do to gather this data about all of our citizens for all time and of course when the pandemic is over why do we continue to need this well it's only about surveillance and so all of these things are just one tiny step away from the major problem of government taking on to itself rights that it didn't have that it couldn't have in any normal period of democracy and once of course governments have rights and the ability to gather information in this way in these covert ways they're never going to give that up so we have to be very wary about those kind of things i think you made a very relevant point because in india as well there was uh, in india they introduced a, uh, something similar a similar app and they made it mandatory that every citizen should have it on their phone and then the some civil society members were preparing a red petition to be moved before the court but then the government subsequently cancelled it and they said that it's not mandatory but it's something which is advised 
and i think the like you rightly pointed out the problem is that it does not come with a sunset clause which means that once pandemic is over there would be discussion on that there is no pandemic anymore but these laws will continue to subsist and being abused and to label people whether they are right left they are with the government or against the government and track their personal lives which is the problematic thing and now mark we have spoken about lot of problems that well, we can have I, can i just pick something else up said because i'm i'm really interested in this point and one of the things that i wanted to do is to look at iran now most people accept that iran is quite a totalitarian environment and one of the things that they're starting to put pressure on is to put people under pressure the media under pressure so i think it is widely accepted that uh iran the state of iran has been lying about the number of deaths there uh from covid but what they are doing is criminalizing people who report that who are in country but it goes beyond that so at least with china they're dealing with it within their own sovereign territory because they would regard hong kong as part of uh a special autonomous region and so it is protected but what we're now in a situation is where we're seeing governments oppress journalists to another level so they're taking them outside the country so if you take iran journalists at the bbc persian service iran international deutsche welle all of which are farsi language broadcasters based outside iran usually in europe somewhere they are th the iranian government are threatening uh in iran the the rest of the family they're threatening the families of journalists that remain in iran so your cousin can be lifted by the police or the secret service because you happen to have been a journalist in london and said something the government didn't like and also as a government as a as a journalist so if you're working in london you have the right to live in london and you're a farsi speaking broadcaster they seize your assets and they freeze your assets that are still in the country so if your parents left you a home in Tehran that is state uh, taken by the state with no compensation just because you said something you didn't they didn't like and we've now got to a state and it's a pretty pass really where Iran's ambassador to London has quite disgracefully abused his diplomatic immunity by threatening what is otherwise a criminal offence to abduct Iranians from the streets of London so he's saying i will abduct journalists in london and have them extraordinarily rendered to tehran and the intimidation of iran has been so successful that many of the farsi speaking journalists in uh, who are working in london are not persians anymore they're afghanis they're persian speaking or farsi speaking afghanis that are working there because it's just too dangerous for people in those countries and it's this kind of long reach effect so the problems that we're seeing at the moment we tend to frame in a domestic environment um so most of the laws that you see in uh india or bangladesh or wherever are nationally based but we're seeing places like china reach into the special autonomous regions and now we're seeing countries like iran reach further they're reaching out to try and have an impact on people who do not live in their country they're trying to censor and stop the speaking of people in their country and they're trying to criminalize people so one of the things that the farsi language broadcasters have a telegram channels so that they can reach the diaspora uh that's talking to them but the in iran the intelligence and public security police the parva as they're known are now running identikit channels from their irregular warfare headquarters in Tehran so they pirate the channels play them out but mix in a dash of disinformation but the really nasty piece here is not the disinformation it's the fact that you're in uh Iran somewhere and you're listening to what you think is a secure signal channel but in fact the people at the parva at the uh, intelligence and public security office and the irregular warfare headquarters in tehran 
no idea precisely who is listening to it. So you are self identifying to the secret police that you are a dissident. And of course they come knocking on your door very soon. So there are much broader problems that are coming out of this. And I think what we're seeing is, um, if you like, the setting of the new bad standards for being able to repress speech and to intimidate people into not speaking. Right, Mark. I think you have raised, and I think this is very interesting from the perspective of understanding free speech from other, another perspective, that if you are you're putting your loved one into danger by speaking your heart out, which is which is very problematic because it's not that you are directly going to be at the receiving end, but your speech speech can right may lead to your friend or your relative to be at the receiving end. And now, Mark, we have spoken so much about the misuse and the abuse and all the things that the government can do. And when we say laws, I have I have noticed one thing particularly during this pandemic that these things which restrict free speech are also not laws. They are basically executive orders which are being passed because, and this actually gives out that a uh, tendency that is being used by the governments to create or secure a kind of permanency in the office because they're using this time not in these emergencies laws, not as a measure to curb fake news or anything, but as a measure to secure a permanency in office. So my yeah, and I think that's really important. The, you, the misuse of executive powers. We see it with Donald Trump because he can't get stuff through the both houses. And so he signs these executive orders and he's probably signed more executive orders than anyone else. But, you know, where he starts a trend, others follow. And it's really an attempt to subvert and get around scrutiny in Parliament, because we all know there's an absolute privilege for reporting on what happens in each and every one of our parliaments, and for good reason. So if the government bring the kind of restrictive laws into uh, scrutiny by the Houses of Parliament, then, of course, they will be reported on and the arguments for not taking away the rights in the way that they do and not criminalizing people in the way that they do will be uh, subject to scrutiny, subject to public debate, subject to public reporting, and the public will know. But of course, by using an executive power, you just say, this is a new law. It doesn't get scrutinized. It doesn't get told whether it's in compliance with human rights law or international law or domestic law or a constitution. And so as a consequence, we're left with a situation where the law is presumed to be lawful until it is struck down. And so as lawyers, this presents an important opportunity for us to safeguard democracy and the rights of individuals by seeking to challenge and where governments subvert the parliamentary process, that should be called out by the opposition, but it should also be called out by lawyers who should test the strength of those laws and the appropriateness of those laws against the national and international frameworks. Truma, I think that is very relevant because now one thing that I've seen is the is the proper check and balances. We have seen from many years, centuries, that when the American Constitution was being framed, one thing which is very important is the is the uh, can you one thing which is very important is to keep check upon the exercise by the executive. I think in the times. I've read many pieces and articles where many authors have suggested that in such a time when executive is given such a high power or such extreme powers, the, the reviews, the check upon the usage of such power should also be extreme. But we have seen that, we have seen in, for example, the Kosovan Constitutional Court was, was dealing with the provision where an executive order was passed which restricted freedom of speech and the court declared that to be unconstitutional on the ground that not an executive order, but only a law can suppress or can abridge freedom of speech. So now, yeah. Mark, we see that we see that some courts have taken a very stringent role. Some courts have become very differential. 
So Mark, what do you think is the role of judiciary in a pandemic, not in, in a pandemic to keep a check upon the usage of the power by the executive and also not to become too activist that it brings down the whole purpose of an emergency provision. So I just want to ask you that what is the role of judiciary to perform its function as a conscious keeper of human rights? Well, I think that the judiciary are charged with being the ultimate arbiter of whether something is a breach of human rights or not. And many of our lawyers who go onto the bench are very, very good commercial lawyers, but they have never really practiced in the area of human rights and it's an alien area. And therefore they tend to show conservatism and deference to the government. And I don't, I don't say that as a criticism, it's just a fact. And it doesn't really matter where in the world you are, it's always the same. But that doesn't mean that the government isn't to be held accountable. The judiciary are the last bulwark against an overreaching government, a government which seeks to impose overbroad and over long restrictions. And it seems to me one of the most simple ways in which many of these laws break international law and domestic law and domestic constitutional law is that they do not have a sunset clause. They do not come to an end when the pandemic is over. They do not destroy the data which has been collected during the pandemic. And that seems to me to be wrong. And so I think only a valid law with a sunset clause can be enacted with special powers because it's meant to be for a fairly short period of time. But also I think we need to see um, that the laws do not criminalize speech. If you commit a libel, you should never be going to jail. Many of the cases that we see in the Inter-American Court of Human Rights, so all of South America, the African Court of Human Rights, the uh, uh, European Court. Many of them have historical anomaly laws which uh, enable us to criminalize speech. And much of that, uh, that legislation goes back to Victorian England, to uh, abusive powers where um, a white, minority government seeks to oppress a colonial power. And it doesn't matter whether you're talking about France, Spain, Portugal, uh, Germany, or Britain. It's the same ways that they used it. So they introduced something called insult laws, and they were designed to repress and subordinate a majority indigenous population. But the problem with those laws is that we don't think that they're compliant with international law. We think that they're inappropriate in the modern era, but many of the post-colonial governments have used them, and I would say abused them, to shore up their position. So insulting a district officer, which criminalizes insults against the dignity of the lowest form of white colonial official, the district officer, and every government official above him, up to prime ministers, presidents, and governors general, is a criminal offense and truth is not a defense. So the man may be a complete imbecile, but you can't call him an imbecile, even if it's true and you can go to jail for it. So it's a major, major problem that we have. And what we're seeing is a sort of regression, a sort of swingometer where we were quite happy with the civil remedies, which our laws gave us to protect freedom of speech and to protect reputation and to protect inappropriate criticism. But we shouldn't be sending people to jail for what they speak and what they think. And that's where these laws have their vice. You're on mute. Uh, thank you. Uh, and Mark, one suggestion that you would give to the courts and what should the court do to keep the government in check? Well, I think the government, uh, the courts have to be brave. I think they have to strike down overbroad legislation. That doesn't mean to say, <laughs> <coughs> sorry, that's consumption, not COVID. Um, the, uh, I joke, of course. But the, what I would say is that 
the governments need to make sure that if we're going to derogate from uh, the rights that we are all have enshrined against us, they should do, for, do so lawfully and legitimately. And to do so lawfully and legitimately, as you mentioned in one of your earlier questions, you can only do that by being proportionate and doing the minimum to derogate that is necessary to meet the mischief that you are seeking to avoid. And if you can do that, that can be a perfectly lawful derogation. So I, my position is not to say there should never be derogation under any circumstances. Of course they should, but they need to be narrowly tailored. They need to meet the mischief that they are seeking to address, and they should be only available to the government for the period that the mischief pursues, ensues. You're on mute again. I'm so sorry. I think I will, I just, I just want to ask you this last question, Mark, to end this wonderful discussion. I would say a, a brilliant learning experience, Mark, because I was just a few days back, I was reading a book by Yuval Noah Harari. Very, the book starts with a beautiful quotation that has, that has got stuck to my mind. He said that in the age of over-information, clarity is power. And I think living in such time makes me think that I think this is the wisest thing that I've read in the recent times, which where the brevity is the soul of wit, Mark. Mark, what I thought after reading this and while preparing for this interview, I thought that we, how would, how would a person, like we are reasonable persons, we can be expected to go out and compare 10 things before we can reach a conclusion. But there are people who actually drank uh, drank acid after President Trump said that, oh, you, I, I have drank that toilet cleaner and, and people drank that after that. So Mark, like we have people who actually blindly trust whatever comes out on the internet. We have what we call the WhatsApp people, they share anything which is available on the internet and they actually blindly follow it as well. So Mark, I think that there can be imposition of certain restrictions on free speech that would not reek of any misgiving, but a sign of good governance. So Mark, what can be those measures which can be restricting free speech, but at the same time, they do reflect a sign of a good governance? Well, I think that that is the sort of thing that you quoted, I think very uh, presciently, uh, uh, the great jurist, Oliver Wendell Holmes. You cannot shout, fire in a crowded theater because you cause harm. And so it's where you cause harm or physical harm is likely to occur by reference to what you say. So if um, uh, you're stupid enough to believe that drinking bleach, which is what uh, President Trump said might be a good idea, don't try this at home, ladies and gentlemen. Um, and the, but the point about that is, to criminalize, well, not to criminalize, but to prevent, to injunct people from making those kind of false statements which are dangerous, of course that's a good thing. That's to the benefit of society. What isn't to the benefit of society is to prevent legitimate criticism of people. True, Mark. I think, I think I want to thank you, Mark. I think you have your vast experience into the field of human rights and your, your career in defending human rights and particularly freedom of speech has been valuable for us because I think we got to know so much from this discussion. And, and for me as a young lawyer who's budding his career into this field of litigation and law, I think whatever you said is very important to remember while growing up in this profession. And I want to thank you on behalf of Young Commonwealth Lawyers Association for sparing your valuable time and speaking to us on this very pertinent issue. And well, now... thank you, Sid. I mean, this has been a really enjoyable conversation, and I hope colleagues will have enjoyed it as well and will continue to enjoy it available on YouTube. Um, but I think it's really important, and people like you carry the torch of freedom of speech, of justice. And what we're talking about here is just justice. It's not about trying to seek political advantage. It's about everybody having a, a fair playing field. And for that, 
we must have freedom of speech. We must be able to receive all shades and colors of opinion, but not dangerous information, and then make up our own minds about what is the right decision for us, our families, and our loved ones. And thank you, Sid, for carrying that torch with the other colleagues in the Young uh, Commonwealth Lawyers Association. Very welcome, Mark. I think now we would open the floor for the questions, if there are any. And uh, I think if there are, just wait for. I see we have a very esteemed audience. So they probably know a lot of this information because they're very clever. So Mark, I think, I think if there wouldn't be any questions, Mark, then I think we would uh, end this session, but on, uh, I think I think there is something. Uh, no, no, no. I think sorry. So, Mark, I think there are no questions that are forthcoming. I think you have been. We've so stumped people into silence. It's wonderful. I think you have been so erudite that you have left people with deliberations than questions. I think you have answered everything that they could have thought of while discussing this. And Mark, I think on this note, uh, we would. Uh, uh, I think I'll we'll end this discussion, and I would again like to extend warmest regard and big thank you for uh, uh, being the first person to attend this webinar and to and to talk about this relevant issue and i think we i look forward to discussing on more pertinent issue in the coming times because i think the governments would come and they'll use and abuse laws and it would be like people like you would always be there to give their valuable contribution so that nothing becomes authoritarian or nothing is being misused. Yeah, and I hope some of our colleagues uh, uh, in the audience uh, today uh, will have the opportunity to speak with you and other young lawyers about these issues of importance and moment, not just to our nations, but to the Commonwealth and perhaps more broadly to society as a whole. So thank you for the insights. Thank you for the probing questions that you've given to me, Sid. It's been a real enjoyment to spend time with you. Thank you. Bye, Mark.